Good morning. And uh, first of all, I want to express my gratitude uh, for being asked to uh, give today's lecture, um, to uh, give a lecture for the Glaucoma Research Foundation uh, is a, a wonderful honor, and to give the doctors Henry and Frederick Sutro Memorial Lecture is a tremendous honor, and I, I'm very grateful and humbled uh, by this. Let me uh, give you my disclosures. And I just want to mention a couple of things uh, about the people that this lecture is named after. Um, and uh, this is just from some research that I did. I, I found out that uh, Adolf Heinrich Joseph Sutro um, was the 24th mayor of San Francisco. Um, he died in 1898. Um, he was a German-American engineer, uh, politician and philanthropist, but engineer. Uh, is the uh, important thing here. And actually, um, you know, this is the type of picture that we usually see of uh, philanthropists. Uh, but the truth is, and many of you who are out there know this, this is another picture of uh, uh, Adolf Sutro. Um, he was a uh, miner, and that was how he generated his, his fortune. And this is him uh, working on the mines uh, and uh, with, his, uh, with his men. Um, his grandson uh, was Frederick Sutro, um, and Frederick Sutro is the father of uh, Henry Sutro. And interestingly, um, Frederick Sutro was an eye doctor. Uh, and his son, Henry Sutro, um, uh, is the person who uh, gave the bequest uh, that endowed this lecture. Um, and this is also a picture of uh, Henry Sutro. Um, and so Henry Sutro wasn't just a, an oral surgeon or a dentist. Um, he was also an inventor. Uh, what you see there is a picture of Henry Sutro with a motorbike that he built in order to deliver newspapers uh, during the war. Uh, and um, uh, he's talking to a, a policeman who was interested in doing something similar for his own children. Well, there are a number of uh, people who have gone before me in giving uh, the Sutro lecture. Um, the inaugural was uh, by Bob Weinreb. Uh, Paul Lee uh, gave the second uh, Sutro lecture. Um, and the uh, third Sutro lecture is sitting right in front of me in the audience uh, here, and that's uh, Richard Lewis. And uh, I'd, again, like to express my gratitude uh, for being asked to give this talk. Now, I'm going to talk about OCT, and I'll talk about the uh, invention of OCT, um, how it uh, came to be where it is, and maybe a little bit about where it's going in the future. OCT was really uh, born in the laboratory of Jim Fujimoto uh, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And the idea was to do a non-invasive tissue biopsy. So to be able to get an image of tissue just using light that would be sufficient to make an appropriate diagnosis or to determine whether or not disease was progressing. And this was uh, done as a, um, a consequence of Jim's work in high-speed lasers at MIT. Uh, and that work that led up to OCT was predicated on work earlier at Bell Labs. And uh, at Bell Labs, they were looking at time gating for ranging. And so the concept is that you can look at reflections from a certain point in space by looking just at the reflections that are coming back at a specific time from uh, something that you're, uh, you're, you're aiming at. So here we have the AT&T logo on your left, and on your right it's covered by some tape and by time-gated ranging, you could just look at the scattered light from that particular plane in space, and you can see the, the logo even though it was masked uh, by the tape. Uh, and the idea was that you could look through uh, objects like skin. Well, I was working in the laser lab at Mass Eye and Ear. This is back in uh, 1989. Um, I'm the guy in the middle with the hair. Um, and 
and similar glasses, actually. Uh, and uh, I was working on a totally unrelated project, but I heard about this thing going on with optical ranging, and they were measuring the cornea and the thickness of the cornea because photorefractive uh, laser surgery was um, being uh, developed. And the idea was you could measure the corneal thickness. Well, as it turned out, um, that uh, project was failing. Um, and a as, as many of you know who are inventors and entrepreneurs in the audience, um, most projects fail. And this project was failing because it took too long to measure the thickness of the cornea. And by the way, you didn't need to do it because you know how much tissue you take off with every eczema laser pulse. And so um, I realized that the wavelength of the light that was being used could reach the retina. And I went in to talk to the head of the laser lab, who was uh, Carmen Pugliafito. So some of you may know Carmen Pugliafito in the audience. Um, and Carmen is a, a, a rather you know, larger-than-life, colorful character. And I was a lowly fellow going into his office telling him about this idea, which I, I have to admit he didn't think was the greatest idea in the world. <clears throat> and he told me that, um, but not in those words. And, and so I, I asked if it was okay if I went over to MIT to see if we could get some uh, signal from the retina. And he said, um, sure, do whatever you want. Again, not in those words. So I went over to MIT with a bag of calf eyes, um, and David Huang, uh, who was an HST student, an MD-PhD student at the time, um, working with Jim Fujimoto, David Huang is now a corneal refractive surgeon who has led some of the largest glaucoma imaging trials uh, in the country and really has continued to push this technology forward. Um, David and I and a, a few other people were in the lab and I took some calf eyes and I cut them in half and we put them under the OCT beam and um, we went out to get some sodas because it took a long time for a single OCT A scan. Um, and we, uh, we came back and there was a signal. And so we knew that we would be able to measure the retina um, with this technology. And after that, it was a lot of hard work um, to get to the point that uh, we were able to image uh, in living beings, but that was kind of the critical proof of, uh, you know, proof of principle moment. David realized that you could take this uh, A scan um, and you could tr scan transversely to make a B scan. And that seems very obvious to everyone in the audience right now, but at the time no one had done it. And so it wasn't obvious until it was actually done. And so uh, that made us go from just having an A-scan uh, with peaks and valleys uh, to actually having a tomogram image. Well, David uh, was the first author on the publication in, um, in Science uh, describing this procedure. This was published in 1991. The image that you're looking at is of a, uh, a human eye, uh, and you're looking at the retina in this, um, in this human cadaver eye. Uh, that's been uh, hemisected, and that explains uh, the um, subretinal fluid uh, that you can see here. It took us a little while to figure out that there was subretinal fluid to explain this dark space because the image didn't come with the labels. And, <clears throat> and then uh, we were able to identify that section in, um, uh, on microscopy as well. The idea of OCT is that you're using um, low coherence light, so uh, broad spectrum, and you are um, using an interferometer in order to measure uh, uh, something in space. And it's a very simple system. And it's the simplicity of it, I think, that gives it so much power. Um, and we're able to get very high resolution because of the low coherence length. Well, this was the first breadboard uh, for OCT, and this was built by Eric Swanson, the man in the middle. Michael He, who is the person on the left, is a retina surgeon here in Northern California. He wrote all of the original software uh, for the uh, imaging and for the image analysis and segmentation. And then this um, was the prototype OCT unit that we used uh, at New England Eye Center uh, to do the original uh, human studies 
um, in a variety of different areas. The person who licensed the technology was actually John Moore, who was president of um, Humphreys Ice, was the name of the company at the time. And uh, John had the foresight to, uh, to see the potential of this technology. And Jay Way was the program manager uh, at Zeiss. Uh, Jay has since gone on to found OptiView. And the first commercial system from Zeiss um, did not do very well, and neither did the second one. But the third one uh, is the one that really caught on. And the third one could scan faster. It um, had a normative database. And also, there was a billing code. And that allowed ophthalmologists to get paid for the work that they were doing, and I, I think resulted in, uh, or was one of the things that resulted in the adoption of the technology. Um, because no matter how good the technology is, if it costs you money and you're not getting paid, it's very hard to justify it uh, from a business sense. This was the most su uh, successful or most rapidly adopted ophthalmic technology uh, in history. And it drives clinical decision making in a variety of different areas of ophthalmology and is continuing to evolve. Uh, this gives you a sense of some of the economics uh, of OCT. Um, it is an investment that your tax dollars were used for. So the federal government, the NIH, made an investment in basic science that resulted in a technology that benefits individuals, that benefits the health of the American people, which is the mission of the NIH, um, and it also benefits the economy. Uh, and I think that this is a very good example of how the NIH can make a difference in the everyday lives of uh, people and make lives better. So what are we doing today? Uh, today, most of us are using spectral domain OCT. This is slightly different than time domain only in that uh, you can scan much faster than you can with time domain OCT. You're collecting all the information from a given A scan simultaneously instead of pixel by pixel. And uh, this uh, is done by uh, looking at the frequency of the light that's returning uh, and then uh, using math to decode it. Um, so spectral domain OCT allows us to scan quite quickly and create three-dimensional images. And by using these volume scans, we can uh, learn more about the tissue, we can get much more reproducible results, um, and we can really use this technology to guide uh, therapy, including surgery. Well, in terms of glaucoma, um, we were interested in the structure-function relationship, and we looked cross-sectionally at the population uh, to find out, um, you know, at, at what point would there be a relationship between visual fields and the structure of the retina, and what we found was that there was a tipping point, kind of a cutoff, at around 75 microns uh, nerve fiber layer thickness, mean nerve fiber layer thickness. And above that uh, nerve, nerve fiber layer thickness, there was not much of a relationship between the two. And below that, the relationship was quite strong. Well, this was an, uh, predicted by the work of Harry Quigley and uh, Al Summer and others who showed that you needed to lose a certain amount of nerve tissue before you would be able to detect a visual field defect. Their prediction um, was somewhat higher than what we found, but their data were based on using older types of visual fields. So we found that you needed to lose about 17 percent before it was likely that there would be a visual field abnormality. Let's schematize that. And so this curve represents what I just showed you. And here uh, you see that when the nerve fiber layer is thick, that um, you're likely to measure abnormalities primarily in the structure, in OCT measured nerve fiber layer thickness. And then you get to a point where you start to be able to measure change both in the nerve fiber layer and in the visual fields. And then finally, you get to a point where the nerve fiber layer thickness measurements bottom out. There's a floor effect. And below that, you're not going to measure change in the nerve fiber layer, but change may still be occurring in your patient, and you, are, um, you can be falsely assured that the patient is stable when, in fact, the patient is progressing if you only look at the nerve fiber layer and not the visual field in late disease. And again, here is the tipping point. Well, that um, theory or hypothesis was based on cross-sectional data. We have longitudinal data now uh, that show that uh, this, in fact, is 
uh, true uh, in, um, in patients across the board. And so you're looking at uh, all of the trajectories of all of the patients in this study. Uh, and what you see is a curve that looks very similar to the curve that I showed you for the cross-sectional data set of the population, but this is longitudinal showing you the actual trajectories of the patients. And let me illustrate that for you in a couple of slides. Here's a slide where you're looking at the top at the visual field index and at the bottom at the nerve fiber layer thickness. And the visual field uh, pattern deviation is shown above on the right and the OCT is shown on the bottom on the right. And what you see is that it's not until you reach the tipping point that you start to have visual field abnormalities. Here's a patient where the, uh, the visual field is already abnormal. Uh, you're below the tipping point, and you're seeing a decay in both the visual field and in the OCT nerve fiber layer thickness. That's in the red curves. But in the blue curves, what you see is that the visual field continues to get worse but the nerve fiber layer thickness measurement is flat. And that nerve fiber layer thickness measurement is flat because you have already hit the floor of what the machine can measure. And so we need to be very careful as clinicians that we don't assume that our patient is stable when in fact uh, they may be progressing when they have thin nerve fiber layer. And that number is at about 50 or 55 microns mean nerve fiber layer thickness. And then here's another patient where the nerve fiber layer is thinning, the visual field is getting worse, and then you hit the floor and the nerve fiber layer thickness is stable, but the field continues to deteriorate. Now, uh, there was a study that was put together by David Wong called the Advanced Imaging and Glaucoma Study, and in that study, uh, we looked at a number of factors associated with glaucoma detection and also measuring glaucoma progression. And what we found was that the OCT abnormality that predicts visual field conversion in people who are suspects or who have preparametric glaucoma is actually in the macula and not simply the retinal nerve fiber layer. And so this is called the uh, ganglion cell complex or the GCC. And specifically, it's the focal loss volume parameter. Uh, and so this is the GCC FLV. And that was the best predictor of glaucoma conversion um, in these patients with preparametric or uh, glaucoma suspect. And you had almost a two-year lag uh, between the time that the disease conversion could be detected by OCT, so progression by OCT, until there was an abnormality on the visual field. Um, they were also, the GCC FLV was also the best single predictor of progression in parametric glaucoma, and that's what you see here. And then the uh, progression detection uh, using the GPA and the trend analysis of the VFI, the nerve fiber layer, and the GCC, you can see that the earliest detection of progression that was statistically significant occurred in the GCC. Um, the OCT um, detects progression earlier among the glaucoma suspect and preparametric glaucoma eyes about two years earlier than you would detect it um, on visual field, so I'm, uh, or by a, the appearance of a visual field abnormality. Um, and so I, I just wanted to point that out. That doesn't mean that the nerve fiber layer is not a useful parameter, it's an extremely useful parameter, but it may also be that the uh, macula uh, will provide us with additional information that will be uh, quite valuable. The last thing that I want to talk about is OCT angiography. And so OCT angiography is what is coming. Um, it, it actually is here in terms of people being able to do OCT angiography clinically, but in terms of the actual quantification of the results and what those results mean, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of understanding uh, OCT angiography, and I think it is going to be quite valuable. So this is uh, work, and the, I have to thank David Wong for lending me these slides. Um, this is new work in uh, parametric glaucoma and in controls, and what you see is that the OCT angiography corresponds uh, quite well uh, to the area of uh, abnormality in the macular ganglion cell complex and in the visual field. 
And if you look at the statistics, what you find is that it's the superficial vascular plexus that is significantly different or significantly lower in terms of uh, vessel density than in the intermediate plexus or the deep plexus when you compare glaucomatous to healthy eyes. So lower vascular density in people with glaucoma in the superficial vascular plexus, which is just what you would expect because of where damage occurs in glaucoma. And this uh, gives you a sense of what the uh, sensitivity and specificity are for uh, these detections uh, in terms of these areas under the ROC curve. And then if you want to look instead at the peripapillary retinal uh, vascular density, uh, you can do that and you find very similar results. And again, uh, high correspondence between the abnormalities uh, in the vascular density uh, and the visual field abnormalities as well as the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. And uh, here you have the uh, radial peripapillary capillary plexus that is the uh, that is statistically d different as well as the superficial uh, vasculature. And these are the areas under the ROC curve for that. And in terms of uh, repeatability, uh, you can see that the repeatability is quite good um, at about 2 percent or actually better than 2 percent uh, uh, coefficient of variation. So to conclude, we have now advanced ocular imaging technology that allows us to visualize and quantify structures that we were not able to uh, quantify before. And we can use this for early diagnosis of disease and also for early detection of change in disease. I've spoken specifically about glaucoma, but the same could be said for other diseases of the retina and of the eye in general. So what's coming down the road? I, I think that we'll see higher speeds. Uh, we'll see better software. We'll be able to do better in terms of the bio uh, the biometrics, the parameters that we're evaluating when we're looking for disease or progression. And hopefully, uh, we'll see what the market usually does, which is to push prices down uh, when we have competition. Uh, and I look forward to that. Um, I want to thank our collaborators, uh, and especially Jim Fujimoto, uh, uh, with whom I've had uh, a wonderful and longstanding collaboration. Uh, the group at NYU, uh, this is our ophthalmic imaging research laboratory uh, group, and I want to thank you very much. <laughs>